on our family. I told Mathieu that I would test him against how many of the points he hit, like I'll grade him on how many points he hit in my presentation when he was building Hitch. So I think uh, we checked some of them, definitely not all of them. Uh, I don't remember how many, but uh, we were really bad on some of, some of them. Clearly, we weren't bad students. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess uh, half was done by us and the other half not at all. So uh. OK, well, we'll be excited to hear about those. But first, you all got to talk to each other and find out three things about yourselves. So I told Mathieu as well that we want to hear some three things about him. Yeah, maybe some fun facts. Yeah, so about fun facts, uh, no, um, I guess one first fun fact is, uh, oh my God, it's really not interesting, but it, I happened to play when I was a kid, uh, electric organ, which is an instrument who nobody plays. I mean, I never met someone that plays that. I've never even heard of that. this instrument. That was a really weird thing. Do you play like Bach on it or? So everybody, everybody uh, asks me if <laughs> I play in the church churches, okay. but actually no, it's just something I played in my rooms and uh, it's more jazzy stuff. Um, and then everyone thought it was Dracula living in your house. But then you can play uh, church stuff and uh, impress everyone, but that's was really not the, the core of it. Another fun fact, I guess, is I'm, I come from uh, Alsace, so I'm really an expert in Alsatian white wines, oh. which is another funny stuff to have. And maybe the third fun, fun fact, uh, it's a kind of a guilty pleasure. I'm really an addict to uh, food delivery. Oh. And I'm that much an addict that all of my friends have been proposed by Deliveroo some subscri subscriptions to have mm -hmm. monthly subscription and have a, a free delivery. But Deliveroo never proposed that to me because I guess they would lose a lot of money with me. So uh, that's uh, pretty bad. Cool, well thanks for sharing those. Um, so I wanted to start this conversation by just getting to know Heech a little bit. How did it get started? We're talking about starting your design culture from day one. And so what is the foundational myth of Heech and, or foundational story rather? Yeah, so we started the, the company in 2013. Uh, we were uh, two co-founders when we started and we were tr really trying to solve the problem of uh, mobility and especially mobility uh, at night uh, for young people uh, in areas with not that much mobility solutions. So. Uh, basically, uh, when we started, uh, it was really hard to find any mobili mobility solutions at night. They were expensive, uh, the mobility solutions were not really friendly, uh, so we really wanted to solve that problem. So, uh, basically, we uh, started to um, go into parties, discuss with people, uh, start to test some ideas without any app, like putting people in some cars with some drivers, uh, testing some prices, and, uh, and that's when we realized that people were okay actually to get into cars with peer-to-peer -peer drivers. Uh, we find a price that would be uh, okay, so we said, okay, that's our solution. Let's create a ride-sharing app with peer-to-peer -peer drivers, opened only at night, only during weekends, and test that. So that's how we uh, started building a really simplistic MVP, like with no payment methods, uh, no functionalities except uh, requesting a driver, uh, and we tested that really quickly, uh, even if the product was not perfect and had a lot of bugs. But basically, we started to uh, go into parties every weekend with my co-founders, uh, conv uh, convincing our target users to potentially use the, the app, uh, discussing with them, uh, and basically, we understood what was not working in, in the product. Did people think you were creepy when you were like, hey, Juliet, do you want to get into a car with that strange person? Well, we had a, a strategy which was to discuss with them when they came into the party. Okay. So that's when we were a bit creepy. And then when we're, they were going out, they were drunk most <laughs> of the time. And then they recognized us and say, hey, you're the guy with the cars and so on. So, so I guess it was pretty OK. And uh, basically, we did that every weekend. So uh, every weekend from midnight to 6 AM, we discussed with our 
target users, uh, seeing what was working, what was not working, and then during weekdays, iterating on the product, and we did that uh, until we nailed the product. So I think we did that during nine months. Uh, we split uh, one party for my co-founder, one party for me, and in the end, I, we must have uh, discussed with uh, thousands of uh, users uh, during nine months. So I think that's how we found our product market fit. We had to iterate a lot, uh, but I mean, uh, yeah, in the end, we discussed with, uh, with a lot of users. That sounds like the funnest app to do research for, I have to say. Just go to parties all the time, tell people to get into cars with strangers, especially if they're drunk. But then you don't get, get a lot of sleep during weekends, but uh, that was uh, really fun, actually. How coherent was the user feedback? Was it like, oh, this is just drive? <laughs> I think it's linked to what you said. It's not necessarily what they say to you, which is important. It's understanding how they behave. Uh, uh -huh. So it's when they struggle with your product that you under understand things. It's, uh, in the end, you start to know them and, uh, and see what the, they, ha they, they have inside, yeah. That's so interesting. I never thought about you know people coming from parties. They might be impaired in some way, can't quite press the right buttons. Maybe their cognitive abilities aren't as sharp. Yeah, so definitely we understood uh, a lot of things. And when we started, I, I think we built a product for drunk people. So now we have evolved from that. But when we started, it was really the case. Yeah. Very interesting. I can talk about this for ages, but I'll actually go on to the next question. So it sounds like you intuitively jumped into the design thinking mode of, you know, empathize and define the problem, then ideate, then prototype, and test, and then iterate. So that kind of cycle, classic uh, design thinking cycle. How did you know that that's what you're supposed, supposed to do? Well, I, actually, we had no idea. Uh, so either it was a good intuition or we were just lucky, but basically w it was our first company. Uh, I was more the product person, my co-founder was more the business person. We knew the problem we were trying to solve and I mean we had no other idea of going to parties to build the product. I mean there were hundreds of people which are our core target users every Friday, every Saturday in the same location and we just have to go them to, to see and try to convince them to, to build the product. That's just what we did because we had no other ideas actually. So it was not done in a design thinking mode, it just we had that intuition and that's what we did. How did you know that you were not user number one? I guess I kind of did. Uh, my co-founder was, was not. Uh, I was a kind of user number one, but quite quickly we realized, because every weekend we were testing the product, that uh, I was not. Uh, I remember at some point we, we designed the, the, pick, the ordering experience a bit like Uber, uh, trying to uh, copy-paste what they did to, to go faster, uh, and we realized that uh, it was not working at all. It was working for me. But then on the Friday we were testing it and we realized people were really not able to request a ride because users were different than Ubers, I guess, uh, were different from me. And I was just seeing that without my help they were not able to request a ride. So um, at You're some point you really understand you designed the, the it and they were drunk when they were trying to use it. And they were drunk. And uh, But definitely uh, you, uh, when you talk to your users every weekend you realize that they're quite different from you. Uh, and they have other ways of thinking and uh, using an app. So that's interesting. That sounds like you know, a moment when you realized, oh yeah, I really have to talk to my users, kind of an aha moment. What are some discoveries that you wouldn't have made without this approach? So <coughs> basically, if I take the ordering experience again, uh, once we realized that we failed with trying to just copy paste what Uber was doing, uh, at that time, Uber was just, uh, when you were ordering a, a Uber, it was just, okay, send me where, tell me where you are and uh, I'll find you a car. So just the pickup address. Uh, and while discussing with our passengers, we were always saying the same thing to try to convince them, which is, okay, where do you go? And we were able to predict a price for them at that moment. And we realized that uh, all the, our core target users 
were really price sensitive and uh, pr having the price before uh, you decide to go for it, it was really important. So I guess that's when we started to test adding uh, a step in the funnel, which was, okay, let's put the drop-off address in order to have a price and then people will request a ride. Uh, and we did that and we realized that really was a game changing in the user experience because at that moment it was uh, not the case in other apps. You didn't have the, the price upfront uh, and our users who were young and needed were really price sensitive. It was really important for them and we wouldn't have been able to, to uh, see that uh, without discussing with them. Very cool. Um, so, how big is your company now? We're about 250 people. Wow, um, okay. So, how have you scaled this user centricity through Teach? Well, first, I guess uh, it was hiring. Uh, we started hiring uh, product managers, uh, designers. Uh, and when we started, uh, like you said, the designers, uh, the designer was a generalist. And then uh, as we scaled, we started to say, okay, we need product designers because our designers were working on a brand marketing product. And at some point we said, okay, we need some designers really focused on the user experience. So basically we realized that if we wanted to scale that, we needed uh, to create teams with a, a product manager, a, a product designer in each team. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a rule of thumb that we have uh, keep kept uh, to make sure that as we scale, we, we, uh, we also scale user centricity. What are some other rituals and practices that you've implemented at Heach to keep the non-user facing functions uh, kind of on board with user empathy and understanding what the pain points are? Yeah, so that's really an ongoing work and as we scale we have to find new strategies. <clears throat> I think from the start we have always asked everyone uh, in the team whatever the, the position to do a support shift. That's really an important uh, point for us to make sure that everyone in the company is aware of our passenger and our driver problems. So every Friday uh, or Saturday evening if you contact the support uh, there's someone from any team that is going to answer you um, and that helps us really to, to keep contact with our user problems. Then we also have on the driver side, uh, which is a really an important community where we really want to create a, a connection with them. We have some uh, events where we really invite everyone from the team to come to the events in order to really interact and talk with our drivers. We have a hitch cafe where drivers come and we also invite people to go there. Uh, in the onboarding sessions, we also train everyone to, to go to the cafe and do support shifts. And just last week, we invented uh, a new, uh, a new uh, action, which is basically go back to our route to do flyering sessions. So uh, a bunch of people last week went to some bars, just trying to convince people to, uh, to use each to make sure that everyone in the, in the company will at some point discuss with users, uh, whether it's the passenger or the drivers. Very cool. And how do you measure uh, whether you're successful in terms of user centricity? That's a really good question that I think uh, we haven't nailed yet. Uh, we have some surveys, uh, some uh, user uh, metrics that we, that we follow. Uh, so I guess for now, we haven't found a perfect, perfect recipe uh, and it really comes to a mix of the metrics we have on one side on the usage of the product, the retention, this kind of uh, uh, metrics, uh, and on the informal feedback we have when we discuss with them. Uh, for example, with our drivers, I think when you go to the H cafes or at the support, you have a kind of a feeling of how the community is feeling about uh, your product. And based on that, so basically the qualitative feedbacks that we have, the quantitative uh, metrics uh, that we have, in the end, you manage to, as a company, uh, know how well you're doing on, on us, but clearly it's not a perfect recipe and uh, we're still improving and iterating on that. Cool. It's great to hear that you have both qualitative and quantitative metrics to get a sense for how your product's performing. So you mentioned that early on you were 
going out to the parties, asking people to get into cars. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds kind of funny when I say it like that. We were doing your research. You were trying to understand how they made decisions, what were their needs, what were their constraints. Um, and then you went back to your office, you worked as a small team on designing it. Everyone was kind of on board because everyone was at those parties. How has the process, product building process, evolved over time uh, at Heach? Is it something that's become, are there certain expectations that you've created for your PMs and designers and developers? How does that work? So I think uh, as we scaled, uh, we made a mistake at some point. Uh, because indeed, we didn't manage to scale it well at first. Uh, <clears throat> because when we were really small, it was really easy. Uh, and then uh, as we were hiring and increasing the team, probably uh, that uh, we were the user number one and we were trying to just iterate because we were really busy uh, shipping features, improving the product, uh, not having time to talk to our users. So I, at, at one moment, I think we really lost contact with our users, uh, which is really bad. Uh, so when we realized it, uh, because basically I realized that neither me or my product managers or product designers were talking to users. We said, okay, that's a real problem. So we created a product framework, which is basically a philosophy on how we want to build product inside the company, uh, which is trying to really make sure we don't forget about the, this mindset and design thinking mindset, where basically you have four uh, we have four big phases in this framework. The first one is uh, opportunity assessment where we define the problem, we frame the problem, we make sure we understood the problem, uh, we define the expectations, the objectives of, of that and the target users. Then the discovery part is really important, which is basically trying to find a solution to the problem, assess the value risk, the usability risks, uh, technical feasibility, and make sure it's valuable for the business. And that's where there's a lot of work uh, with designers, product managers, uh, engineers, uh, and anyone in the company uh, ide ideating, uh, prototyping, testing in real uh, uh, quick uh, loops, uh, where basically the rule of thumb that we have today is try at least to speak to your users once per week. Uh, we sh that's the, the reason we are trying to, to achieve where designers and product managers speak to their core users at least once per week. Then there's the delivery phase, which is more the realm of the engineers where they implement the solution. And then monitoring is again making sure that you've closed the loop, that you've solved your problem. Uh, and then you decide, okay, should we iterate or have we solved the problem? Uh, and having that framework right now is really helping us to make sure we solve the good problems, that we focus on the users, uh, try to understand their problems, and really try to iterate as fast as we can in discovery. And that can be done only by talking to users, prototyping, and putting uh, the product in their hands before we try to implement it. Very cool. So you are 250 people now. Um, how would you adapt this process or advise that smaller or startup, you know, early stage startups adapt this process so that they aren't slowing themselves down, so they're shipping quickly and learning? So, yeah, that, that's basically why we don't call that a process, but more uh, philosophy, because it's what it's making you do that's important, not the process itself, and the phases are not that important. It's more what you do inside. So. Basically, uh, it's really linked to what you said. Uh, when you're really small, put your product in front of uh, your users as soon as you can, even if it's not ready, if, even if it's just a prototype, actually. But try to put it as soon as you can because you need to get learnings as fast as you can. And I guess uh, all your assumptions uh, will be false. So you need to talk to your users to validate any assumption you do. Uh, so I guess if you put your product soon in the hands of your users and then you talk with them and you validate your assumptions, at the end you, you'll start to create a really learning loop where you start to get learnings and what actually matters the most I guess is not building the best product at first but really uh, learn as fast as you can because it's the velocity of learnings that's actually going to make you succeed in the end. 
That's really cool. Um, I really love the idea that you um, talked about, you know, learning quickly, the velocity is, is really what wins the game. And that's uh, what McKinsey found through their studies too. Um, can, you, can we go back to the story you told in the beginning? Uh, you mentioned that in the beginning you didn't even have a prototype. You know, a lot of people probably assume that, okay, I wanna build an app to do X. So they get together and they start building an app. But you didn't do that. What did you do? Can you walk us through the process of your initial prototypes and what they looked like? So basically what we had <coughs> was uh, we had partnerships with some drivers which were okay to do some testings during the weekends. Uh, we had some kind of tool that we had internally that where we could book a driver uh, so we were with a laptop in parties and trying to convince people to get in a car and then just making sure that the driver uh, was available at that moment uh, with our lat laptop uh, and the drinks. And uh, so what was important for us was just getting to know if passengers were okay to take a ride with a stranger. What was the price point? Uh, were they able to take a decision uh, late in the evening? And then making sure that there's kind of a product market fit, but that's it. We didn't want to test right now uh, if they were uh, happy with a, an app or a product. We just wanted to, to, to validate the, the business idea behind. Cool, so there wasn't actually anything that you, that your client or clients or potential users had to download, it no. was completely. Well, actually we were the product. We were uh, acting as the product. Very cool. Um, so we talked a little bit about you know how you design the form of uh, or the function of your app. But let's talk a little bit about the form because that's also a really important part of design: the delight, the aesthetics, the beauty of it. Um, Heach is kind of known for this vibrant pink color. How did you come up with the visual language of your brand? So, actually, uh, we were two full-time co-founders, but there were part-time co-founders uh, behind the scenes, and one of them was a designer. So that's clearly him that helped us from the beginning to, to have a clear identity and making sure that as we build a company and a product, we also build a brand. So I think that's why it was all, all, always important for us to make sure that we were uh, managing to create an emotional connection with our, uh, with our users. I think <clears throat> what we failed to do at some point was to uh, put that inside our, our product. Uh, and right now uh, we are rolling out a new design for our, our app and our product to make sure that now the brand and the product are aligned. Because I guess that at some point you just prioritize stuff inside your roadmap that is uh, helping on reliability or really critical stuff, but you can forget about uh, look and feel and design. But right now we are, we are a few days away to roll, roll, uh, roll out that, uh, that new design. So yeah, I think it's really important to make sure that we manage to create a big a brand, a vibrant br brand, uh, who's able to create connection with uh, your passenger and your drivers. Uh, and that has to be uh, in your app as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole idea of having a holistic experience that your user is not interacting with an app and they're not interacting with your marketing site or even with your customer support care team. It's uh, the entire experience that's one unified Heach experience because every touch point, they just think Heach. They don't think Heach support, Heach app, Heach this or that. It's really the holistic thing. So that's why it's so important to have that seat at the table for someone who's advocating for the users and saying, hey, hey, marketing people, you're going in that direction, whereas the care team is going in that direction and the product is going here. We need to make sure that we're thinking about users and bringing them all together. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> we've also uh, created a design system which will help us to create that homogeneity across all touch points. Uh, because indeed b before that uh, we were just adding stuff uh, on top of stuff and there was no uh, homogeneous uh, experience and right now uh, with the new design uh, that's going to be launched uh, we will have a design system across all touch points that will help us also to to level up our expectations on that 
So design system is interesting that you bring it up, is a hot topic in the design community these days. Right. Everybody wants to build a design system. Um, but you're 250 people now, and you're, I guess, rolling out your maybe, uh, what version of the design system is this? Um, it's the first the one. The first one, okay. We just rolled the design system out at Algolia, and we're almost 400 people. So uh, as you can see, design systems are really important for scaling companies, for making them efficient, consistent in their visual language, uniting the brand and the product. When, if you could do it again, like, maybe you can evaluate, is this the right time to roll out the system? Should you have done it earlier? Should you, when, when's the right time to start thinking about this? That's a good question. Um, actually, I, I think once you have that in mind, it's maybe not that complicated to think about having a design system because it's really uh, then helping you on velocity and uh, having a coherent uh, system uh, of role. So I would need to ask my designers and engineers uh, what would be the burden of, do it, of doing it uh, uh, earlier, because I don't think it's, uh, I think you could do it quite early actually, uh, as, as long as you make sure that uh, it's not uh, going, going in the way of velocity. But at some point we did it because we needed to go faster. Um, and uh, each new screen, each new feature, we were reinventing the wheel. Uh, and I think if you have a design system, actually you're, you're going faster. So I don't think, I don't know why you should not do it uh, early actually. Very interesting. You mentioned that there were some things that you were missing from the product and that you're trying to put in in terms of the delight, that uh, brand experience. Can you give us some examples um, of what those things are? <coughs> maybe without giving too many spoilers about the new product. No, basically first the look and feel is going to be really more uh, up to date. Uh, so that's just ba basic uh, uh, UI uh, stuff. And then we are going to start uh, adding more uh, branding moment, I guess, in the inside the app, uh, in moment where users are not focused on crit critical actions, but try to add more uh, emotions or in some moments where they are waiting for the drivers or when you just open the app. Uh, we've always tried to, even in the copy, to uh, add some elements to create some connection with the, with the users. And right now with the new design system, a uh, new platform, we are going to be able to add really more easily some, uh, some uh, cool elements like that uh, as, we, as we scale. And why is that important? I'm asking these questions because I kind of said form follows function, but I want to focus a little bit on the form because that's what design is known for in a lot of ways. And we also want to pay homage to the aesthetics and the, and the joy that that can bring. So why is it important for you to incorporate those uh, <coughs> elements in there? Well, basically we are on a market, uh, so the, the ride sharing market, which is highly competitive. Uh, so for us, it's always been important to um, make sure that we are able to create a connection with our users and we want an emotional connection. We don't just want users to use us because we're the cheapest. Uh, we want in the end to make sure that you use us because they have a connection with us. So that comes with price, but it comes with uh, look and feel, uh, with the brand uh, inside your app, in, the, in your communications, in the vision of the company and the why we do it. So I think all of that is connected is in, and is really important. And we're not just trying to give them cheap rides. We're really tr just trying to help them in their everyday life. And the form and the look and feel is really important in creating that connection. So it sounds like it's a whole ecosystem rather than just the hot pink color. It's more than that because you had the hot pink color before, but now you're adding, you're creating the whole experience of the language, like you said, the company values, how your care team interacts with uh, the customers to really build that sense of community and... Yeah, basically uh, our vision is really to uh, make sure that uh, we want to prove that tech solutions and tech in general uh, can build human solutions. Uh, and that uh, reflects in everything that we do from the communication to the care. We really want to make sure that when you have a problem on each, uh, some real people are going to help you uh, in a really friendly way. Uh, it has to reflect in the product, in the brand, in everything. And uh, indeed, 
we want to be a human-centric company, and uh, obviously uh, look and feel and design is really important to, to help us uh, insist on that, that direction. Great. So just to kind of wrap up this specific conversation, so why are designers so fundamental to the process? You know, I made a point in my conversation that uh, anyone really can be an advocate for the user, but why are designers specifically um, valuable? In, inside the company, indeed, product managers and designers are really central to uh, user centricity, but I don't know in other companies, but in, uh, at each, uh, product managers have all, or a lot of other topics to cover. So we really uh, define that uh, it's the product designers that should be the experts and the champions of all the user centricity processes like user research, user interviews, uh, usability testings, uh, prototyping. So you need experts and, uh, and for us, product designers are the one that will make show that uh, collectively we can improve on that. So they uh, teach uh, pr product managers to do that, but other operation managers and uh, local country launchers. Uh, so basically, product designers are the one that will make sure that uh, we are getting better uh, on that uh, every day. Very cool. So you mentioned that you followed some of the tips that I gave in my presentation, but then some you didn't do. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you did, what you feel you didn't do, and what you could have done differently if you had to start Heach all over again. So b basically, I guess at some point, uh, as I mentioned, we lost contact with the users. So uh, definitely that's something we did when we started, but as we scaled, we uh, forgot about it. Uh, so I would make sure that as you hire people and as you scale, you make sure that there are still a lot of people that talk to the users uh, and especially the one that build the product all the time. Uh, and I guess at that moment we lost a bit uh, empathy. Uh, we had it when we started, we have it back now, but at some point we, we lost it. Uh, and uh, you need to make sure that um, as you scale your company, you don't lose that. Uh, it's really easy to say, okay, let's now build a company and uh, be in our office and just we now we know stuff and we just need to, uh, to execute. That's actually not true and, uh, and that's definitely something that, uh, that we would change uh, if I had to go to the, in the past. So you mentioned a few pieces of advice for scaling companies. I think we have a lot of people here who are either thinking of starting a company or very early in their stages, the stage of their company. What advice do you have for them? Maybe they can't hire a designer, let's say, or you know, they're really just at the beginning of their journey. What do you think they should think about? Well, it's really uh, what I, I said before, which is uh, put your product in front of your users as soon as you can. and. Uh, validate your assumptions with them by talking to them as much as you can because most of the time your assumptions will be will be wrong so i think even us who uh, were testing a lot of stuff every weekend at some point you always want to make it a bit more perfect uh, and yeah there's always a way to go faster uh, and really just try to do it as fast as you can even if it's just a prototype and just put it uh, in front of some users and discuss with them to understand wh what the, are there problems, uh, how you could solve them, understand the why behind. Uh, so yeah, I don't think you need a designer to do that. Uh, you just need the mindset to make sure that you are solving uh, someone's problem. And one, of, one last question from me, and then we can open it up for the audience. Do you have any fun stories from those parties? Like when you were test, I'm like very intrigued by this concept of going to parties to test your product. Um, anything, any funny stories that happened uh, while you were, you know, trying to figure out the concept for your product? Um, I think because we were in nightclubs every weekend, uh, at the end we were really well known from uh, party bouncers, so it was really easy for us to, to go in any party. And, uh, and that's actually how I met my girlfriend, because... Um, I She's a bouncer? No, uh, we, we were going to... A, it was a, 
uh, first time we were meeting and uh, we went to a party and there was a one hour queue. And then I came to the bouncer and he told me, hey, your age? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we got in, inside the party and that, that's how we met. Now the real story is he came up to this girl and he was like, hey, do you want to go get in a strange car? <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's a nap. <laughs> Just kidding. I made that up. That's pretty fun. Do you still uh, use those uh, bouncer connections to go to parties? No, today? they completely forgot about me. So uh, no, it's useless now. You need to go meet meet more of your users. Yeah, but they're not in our users right now. Are not necessarily uh, going to parties now. There are a lot of everyday people. Uh, so now we meet them. Uh, in uh, tr train stations. In church? In, uh, no, but uh, that, that, that's actually a, a challenge we have. It's pretty easy to meet our drivers, but our passengers right now, uh, we have millions of uh, passengers, so it's really tricky to say, okay, how to meet them easily. Uh, because when you uh, send them an email and say, hey, let's uh, discuss about the product, you only get people that are really interested in that. Uh, when you get into a McDonald's, you have a certain type of users. When you get, go to a Starbucks, you, you have another type of user. So we really like this guerrilla uh, user testing uh, style, but it's pretty hard actually to, to find a good balance of uh, representativity of your users. Uh, so on the passenger side, it's actually a challenge. That's actually a really interesting topic. So it sounds like your user base has changed a lot as you've scaled and grown. Um, how did you adapt to that? Um, you mentioned it's hard, but what are some things you're trying to adapt to making sure that you're not stuck with one persona or one person you're designing for, but you're actually, when did you start noticing that that started changing and how do you keep updated? We, we have aha moments a bit all the time. Uh, and the last time was uh, last week. Because right now we realize we have to send some emails to our passengers to know about them. And uh, last time we sent some emails and we were asking some uh, elements about the age or uh, where they live. And we, we had some surprises like uh, we don't have uh, that many young people anymore uh, and uh, the, the targets have really changed. So uh, as we grow, we, we realize that uh, you, all, you never know your users enough actually. That's very interesting. So. How do you? How have you adapted your product based on that? I guess um, if your initial users, you were trying to make sure that they could order a cab ride drunk, then now it's different. It's not a, such an issue anymore. How does that impact your decisions? Well, it's clearly com complicated our decision-making process. Uh, and now we are in uh, a lot of countries in Africa as well. Uh, we are in Morocco, Algeria, and Cameroon, which have really different use, uh, usages. Uh, uh, even just our drivers on Android and our, our drivers on iOS have completely different behaviors. Uh, so it's actually a, a real struggle to make sure that the product you build is, is going to work for, for everyone. Uh, so I guess what we are trying to do is make sure that the decisions we take are going to work for everyone, at least our users.